Hey guys and welcome back. This week as part of my history series I want to talk about an awesome woman, Madam CJ Walker, who was recorded in the Guinness Book of World Records as the first female self-made millionaire in America. A lot of sources tend to cite her as the first black female self-made millionaire in America, but I think it's an important distinction to note that she wasn't just the first black woman to reach her accolade, she was the first woman full stop. And I think that shows a true level of her accomplishments, at a time when black people in America face more obstacles than you could imagine today. A truly impressive woman. She created a specialised line of hair products for black women after suffering from hair loss and she created an empire on the back of this. But there was and remains some controversy around her story, so let's dive in. Of course this video is sponsored by Magellan TV, who I have a long standing sponsorship with. They're a streaming service dedicated purely to documentaries and each month I like to make a recommendation of a couple of documentaries that I think you should watch and they've got so much fantastic brand new content being released every week I never run out of things to watch. The first documentary I want to mention this month is The Alps Murders about the still unsolved murders of the Alhili family in Annecy in the French Alps. You may recall that I covered their case in a video on my channel not too long ago and even though I already knew the details of this case, I found this documentary fantastic. It has access to prosecutors and other people close to the investigation as it reconstructs the events of that day. It's very much worth a watch. The second documentary I want to recommend is a six episode series called Hard Earned America on Minimum Wage. This series follows five families around the USA who survive on minimum wage in the 21st century. It really is incredibly eye-opening and quite emotional at points as these families join others across the nation calling for an increase in minimum wage. Magellan TV have everything from true crime to science, history, nature and everything in between with new programmes added weekly you can be watched anywhere on your TV, laptop and mobile. It's compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play and iOS and loads of the programmes are available in 4K as well. If you enjoy my channel and what I do here then honestly I cannot stress enough how much you will love Magellan TV. And I'm happy to announce that my viewers can now take advantage of an exclusive offer. 30% off of an annual membership. That's an entire year of a catalogue of over 3,000 documentaries for less than $3.50 a month. Simply click on the link in the description to claim your discounted annual membership today. And that does include those of you who are already signed up to Magellan TV. Just let your subscription lapse and then you can claim this offer for yourself. On the 23rd of December 1867, Sarah Breedlove, who would later become known to America as Madam C.J. Walker, was born to Owen and Minerva Anderson Breedlove, who had been enslaved on a plantation in Delta, Louisiana. Sarah was actually the first member of their family to be born free, after the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. She was the youngest of six children, with one older sister and four brothers. The whole family were owned by Robert W. Burney until emancipation. The entire Breedlove family lived in a simple wood cabin, and despite having been freed from slavery, they remained in Delta as sharecroppers, still working on the same land they had done for the last two decades. But tragedy would strike Sarah from early in life. Her mother would die when Sarah was around four or five years old, probably from cholera, and her father died a couple of years later as well. At the age of just seven, she was an orphan. Her older sister Lavinia took custody and she moved to Vicksburg, Mississippi to live with her and Lavinia's husband, Jesse Powell. It seems like once there, Sarah was expected to contribute towards the household despite just being a child. She joined her sister working in the cotton fields. But life with her sister and brother-in-law was not easy, with Jessie being described as abusive towards her. So to escape, Sarah gets married at the age of just 14 to a man called Moses McWilliams. It 
seems to be a union of convenience rather than anything else, and little records exist of both Moses and their marriage. It's thought that maybe it was even a common law marriage, non-ceremonial, just this legal framework through which a couple are considered married without having formally registered a marriage. I want to note here that one of my main sources for this video is a book called Self Made or On Her Own Ground by Alelia Bundles. Alelia is CJ Walker's great great granddaughter and her official biographer. She dedicated her life to learning as much as she can about the life and times of her great great grandmother and sharing her story with the world. I mean who better to learn from than a direct descendant? I would highly recommend giving this book a read if you want to delve even deeper into the story of this just fascinating woman. There's also a Netflix show called Self Made, which was based on this book, featuring the amazing Octavia Spencer. I will admit I haven't seen the show for myself because I just don't have time, but I've heard really good things and the book it's based on is fantastic. A few years into her marriage, Sarah gave birth to her only child, a daughter, Lelia, who would later go on to be known as Alelia Walker a name passed down through the generations all the way to her great-great-granddaughter, Alelia Bundles, the writer of her biography. Lelia was born on 6th of June 1885, when Sarah would have been just 17 years old. The birth of her daughter may well have been what spurred Sarah on in her success years later, the determination to provide for her daughter, for her never to go hungry as she used to have to do. A couple of years later, Moses would die. Nobody really knows how, although theories range from a workplace accident to a lynching. Sarah was now a widow at just age 20 with a child to raise. Knowing that she can never return to the clutches of Jesse Powell, she heads north to St Louis, where her older brothers had settled and been running a successful barber shop for six years. She gets a room in a rougher part of town and quickly gets a job as a laundress. This was in a time, of course, when you couldn't just throw your dirty clothes into a washing machine. Washing clothes was a long and laborious process, which you would outsource as soon as you could afford to do so. Alelia Bundles writes in Self Made that more than half the employed black women in St Louis were washerwomen the majority of the time for rich white families, making as little as just $1.50 a day. Sarah soon made friends with a number of other black women in St Louis, through her job as a laundress and through her church, St Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church. There she met a woman called Sarah Newton, who had recently founded the St Louis Coloured Orphans Home, who offered to help educate Lelia which is a privilege that Sarah really never got to experience herself, she never got to attend school. In her daughter's best interest, she agrees to send Lelia, a so-called half-orphan, to the home to live there a couple of days each week to get her education. Soon, alongside a number of other residents, Lelia was enrolled in the local school, something which only could have happened with the help of the orphanage. Eventually, Sarah even enrolled in night school herself, finally getting her own formal education. She would have studied everything from bookkeeping, English, reading, arithmetic and geography. But despite how hard she worked, Sarah always struggled to keep afloat. Her and Lelia would have to move often, a lot of the time having to go and stay with one of her brothers. Sarah knew that she would not be able to work as a laundress forever, it was very hard work, it was hard on the body, and she was only going to get older. She had to come up with a plan, but inspiration wouldn't strike for a number of years. Around 1894, Sarah ends up remarrying to a man called John Davis, who had no home for his own, so had to move in with Sarah. This marriage certainly wasn't for wealth or any prospects, maybe it really was a marriage of love, or maybe it was because Sarah thought she would seem more respectable if she was married. But it seems that she regretted this marriage from very early on. Being a black man himself, obviously, John's work prospects weren't much better than hers, and it seems that he never really had much ambition to work at all, certainly not enough to provide for his now family. 
Their marriage would last almost a decade, but it was rocky from the outset. They likely separated and reunited several times during this period. In the early days of this marriage, Sarah started to notice that her hair had started to fall out. Sadly, this was not a rare occurrence for women, particularly black women, in this era. It was a time in which it wasn't as easy to wash as it is nowadays due to a lack of indoor plumbing and electricity. And this in turn led to illness, high fever, scalp disease such as dandruff, lice, fungal infections and more. There were low protein diets and damaging treatments. Sarah was also dealing with a lot of stress due to her husband's behaviour which I'm sure didn't help. She feared that she was on the verge of going bald and her hair was important to her and her community. Today in the 21st century, a lot of black people would say that their hair is an integral part of their identity. Speaking as a clearly very white person, I can't claim to understand the relationship between black people, their hair and their culture, but I'm going to try my best to share what I've learned through my research for this video. But if you're black and have any more to add on this topic, then please feel free to do so in the comments. According to stylists online, in Africa over the centuries, different hairstyles, so braids, twists, dreadlocks and more, were used to symbolise a person's tribe, social status and their family background. Their hair was a point of pride. But then thousands of African people were ripped from their homeland by the transatlantic slave trade. Once enslaved, there wasn't much time allowed for black people to take care of their hair, nor were the products that they would traditionally use available. Many enslaved women would find themselves using bacon grease, butter and even kerosene in an attempt to keep their hair clean and conditioned. Black beauty in the Western world was ridiculed in comparison to the white Eurocentric beauty standards. Black hair was called wool, it was dehumanised. And of course, there's only so much ridicule one can take before you start to doubt yourself and your beauty. Lighter skinned black people with less kinky hair were sold for much more money than the darker skinned people with kinkier, coarser hair. Even within the enslaved people community, hair began to be compared. Straighter hair was deemed much more attractive. So much so that by 1872, a French hair stylist called Francois Marcel Gratteau invented the first hot comb for straightening hair. It was marketed in a way that if black people used such a tool, they could be deemed more attractive. A lot of people actually mistakenly believe that Madam C.J. Walker is the one responsible for the invention of the straightening comb and even chemical perms, but that's not true, she didn't invent those. I mean, even today there's still stigma around black hairstyles. I mean, we've all seen the reports of black children in Western countries being sent home from school because of distracting and unusual hairstyles. Regular black protective or natural hairstyles. Many people are working to change this narrative to celebrate natural black hair, but it's a journey. That's a very brief history of black hair, just for a little bit more context of what we're talking about here. In Sarah Breedlove's time, there was a huge lack of hair care products for black textured hair, and no help if your hair started to suffer the impact of a life of poor care. She thought her own hair was unsightly, and this wasn't helped by the fact it was all falling out. In an attempt to solve the issue, Sarah tried a number of different concoctions at home after asking her barber brothers for help. It wasn't quite as simple as going to a shop and buying something, because products for black hair just didn't really exist on the shelves. But in 1902, a woman called Annie Minerva Turnbow arrived in St. Louis to make the most of the incoming 1904 World Fair, where she set up shop on Market Street. She was a black hairdresser who specialised in scalp treatments and hair growing. Sarah's search for a cure for her hair soon led her to Annie Turnbow's door. Annie taught Sarah everything she'd learned about hair loss. Lessons that might have simply been to shampoo her hair more often, using a shampoo she created herself. Years later, Sarah would be accused of stealing Annie's formula for her own line of hair care. 
but the truth may well be that neither of them created this. It was simply a sulphur-based formula, the same base used in home remedies and medicinal compounds for centuries. We've already covered that Sarah's job as a laundress didn't make her too much money, but being a black woman, she didn't have too many other options for employment. But around the time of the 1904 World's Fair, Sarah became what was called a Poro agent for Annie Turnbow, selling Annie's products around St. Louis, one of Annie's very first salespeople. Sarah joined a group of black women selling her products. But not only that, they were also taught Annie's special secret methods for nourishing the scalp. Turnbow's products were different from a lot of stuff on the market at the time, which was mostly marketed to making black hair straighter, whiter. A lot of women had grown sick of this and just wanted something that would work for their hair as it was. Annie Turnbow's The Great Wonderful Hair Grower was just that, and Sarah believed in the product. It had worked for her after all. In 1903, Sarah's relationship with John had finally ended, but they were still living together. They both moved on to new relationships and Sarah met a man called Charles Joseph Walker who lived nearby in St. Louis. He was in a way the antithesis of John. He was a newsman selling subscriptions and advertising in one of St. Louis's black newspapers. He had experience as a barber and working in a saloon and had a formal education. He had ambition that matched Sarah's own and she saw a future together with him. And he would be vital to what happens next in her story because they would end up marrying a couple of years later. By 1905, Sarah is finally done with St. Louis. She wanted a fresh start and decided to make her move to Denver, Colorado, where her sister-in-law lived with her four daughters, Sarah's nieces. Sarah gets on a train with a bag full of Turnbow's wonderful hair grower, ready to further her sales in a new city. She'd heard that Denver soil contained alkali that was bad for the hair, although in hindsight it was more likely the mountain climate being bad for the hair than anything else, and she believed there would be a whole new market awaiting her there. But of course she wasn't able to front herself entirely on her sales, she did have to get another job to tide her over once in Denver. She would later say that she got a job as a cook in a boarding house. It's thought that she would have required more soaps and medical supplies to supplement what Turnbow provided to her once in Denver, so it's very likely that she would have turned to the Schultz Drug Company. Alelia Bundle speculates in her book that it's likely that Schultz may have helped Sarah analyse the ingredients in Turnbow's products while she was still selling them. Eventually, Sarah saved enough money to quit her cooking job and open her first laboratory in a little attic to experiment with ingredients for her own hair care formula. She would later say that in this time she prayed to the Lord and as a result had a dream that a big black man appeared to me and told me what to mix for my hair. Some of the remedy was from Africa, but I sent for it, mixed it, put it on my scalp, and in a few weeks my hair was coming in faster than it had ever fallen out. She said that this is how she came up with a miracle cure for her ailments, that it came to her in her sleep. And this would later prove to be a fantastic marketing device. Hair care makes a bit of divine intervention. The truth is, it probably wasn't divine intervention that helped Sarah come up with a formula for her own products. It was probably a bit of everything. Knowledge about what was in both Turnbow products and other ingredients on the market, and a lot of experimentation to find out what worked best. She's often accused, like I said before, of stealing the formula from Turnbow, but she didn't steal anything directly. Perhaps you can say she improved upon it. She definitely used it as a jumping board. Every historical figure has their flaws, I suppose. In her later marketing, her story of the dream, Sarah would make out like the formula she had created had direct links to Africa, which drew in the black population, eager to make connection to their ancestors. Ancestors they didn't know. They didn't even know where they'd come from. This magic ingredient was likely just coconut oil though, 
which could have come from Africa, but also could have just come from Denver. Other ingredients in her own products would be petroleum for the oil base, beeswax, copper sulfate, violet extract perfume, and carbolic acid, which was a very standard ingredient list for the time, but we all know the magic of coconut oil even today. It was also around this time that CJ Walker, the male CJ Walker, was finally convinced to move to Denver to be with Sarah and they got married. Sarah tried out her new name, Mrs. CJ Walker or Madam CJ Walker. It worked and it would become her branding. To save confusion, I'll continue calling her Sarah for the rest of this video, but to most people, she will forever be known as Madam CJ Walker. It was also around this time that Sarah began to distance herself from Turnbow's products, perhaps realising that by this time her own business could thrive, as she had completely separated from her by 1906, starting a lifelong rivalry. From here on out, Madam CJ Walker would begin selling Madam Walker's Wonderful Hair Grower, a scalp conditioning and healing formula. The product was a hit. To promote her new business, Sarah would travel throughout the South and Southeast for a year and a half, selling her products door to door and holding demonstrations publicly when she could, mostly in churches and lodges. And it's worth mentioning that she was 38 years old at this point. There's no age limit to success. Her husband started to help her with advertising and establishing a mail order business ensuring that anyone across the country could get their hands on her products. This was genius. Sarah was a natural teacher. The demonstrations that she held were always successful. And many people have said that the formula wasn't even the reason for Madam CJ Walker's success. It was Sarah's charisma, natural charm, and her understanding of what black women wanted. Sarah's method was known as the Walker system, involving scalp preparation, lotions and iron combs. In a time when most other black hair products were manufactured by white businesses, hers actually paid attention to what black women wanted. Plus, many black women wanted to buy from her, they wanted to support another black woman. They enjoyed seeing one of their own succeed. Before long, Sarah had an army of agents outselling her products door to door, as she had done for Turnbow years before. 1907 was her first year on the road selling products, and she made over $3,500, triple what she'd done the year before, and more than a lot of corporate Americans. And safe to say that by this point, her husband didn't really like his wife being the breadwinner. He struggled with the situation and would begin to tell people that the entire company was his idea, which it wasn't. He was happy to help her out at the beginning, but when he realised how successful she was, he couldn't hack it. In 1908, Sarah would temporarily move the business's base to Pittsburgh, where she opened Lelia College to train her hair culturists, as she called them. Then in 1910, she moved the business headquarters to Indianapolis, a city with strong black culture and access to good transport links for easy distribution. And she left the running of the Pittsburgh branch to her daughter, Alelia. In Indianapolis, she built a factory, a hair and nail salon, and another training school. This is where Madam CJ Walker would hit the peak of her career. The next decade would be hugely successful for her. At its height, the Madam CJ Walker Company would employ over 3,000 people. She would grab national headlines when she contributed $1,000 to the building fund of the Coloured YMCA in the city, which was a huge accomplishment for anyone to have that much money to give away. She became one of the best known black people in the country and the black press embraced her. What she'd been able to do was something which everyone aspired to. She also left her husband around 1910 due to his inability to accept her success. He just couldn't hack it and it seems he turned to drink and infidelity to deal with his issues, so she got rid. Never one to stop working, in 1913 she travelled down to Central America and the Caribbean to expand her business overseas 
whilst Alelia, her daughter, moved to Harlem, New York, into this incredible Harlem townhouse. Apparently this house was amazing, designed by a black architect with nothing to equal it for miles. Alelia loved Harlem so much that by 1916, Sarah decided to join her herself, leaving the running of the company in Indianapolis to trusted employees. She would oversee everything from a New York office, but once in New York, she also became preoccupied with the social and political life of Harlem, which was in the midst of the Harlem Renaissance, the development of the neighbourhood as a black cultural mecca. It was the centre, the place to be. The townhouse became a salon for members of the Renaissance, people in and out constantly. Sarah took personal interest in the NAACP's anti-lynching movement at the time, to which she contributed $5,000, a mind-blowing amount of money. This would be over $121,000 now. She also joined the executive committee of the New York chapter of the NAACP and when in July 1917 a white mob murdered more than three dozen black people in St. Louis, Sarah, along with a group of other Harlem leaders, visited the White House to present a petition advocating federal anti-lynching legislation to President Woodrow Wilson. Alongside this, her business was still growing and she built her own ornate mansion that she named Villa Luaro in Irvington on Hudson, New York. Villa Luaro would become another gathering place of visionaries of the Renaissance and was even designated a National Historic Landmark in 1976. In 1927, the Walker Building in Indianapolis, which is an art centre that Sarah began working on before her death, was also opened and again was eventually registered as a National Historic Landmark. It was an important black cultural centre in the city for decades. Sarah's success at this time was unmatched, but not only was she a successful businesswoman, she was also trying to make a difference. Eventually, she had so many agents selling her products that they had to be organised into local and state clubs. In 1917, she held a convention in Philadelphia called the Madam C.J. Walker Hair Culturist Union of America Convention, which was one of the first national meetings of businesswomen in the country. She took the opportunity of the gathering to encourage her agents to be politically active as well as selling products. She said, This is the greatest country under the sun. We must not let our love of country, our patriotic loyalty, cause us to abate one whit in our protest against wrong and injustice. We should protest until the American sense of justice is so aroused that such affairs as the East St. Louis riot be forever impossible. At the convention, while she rewarded those who had sold the most and who had bought in the most sales agents, she also rewarded those who made the most charitable contributions to their communities. She was never scared that sharing her views would affect sales. Activism was much more important than business to Sarah. Throughout her life, Sarah bequeathed nearly $100,000 to different charities and people in need, which is about $2.5 million today, and that would only increase upon her death. Not only did she eventually become America's richest woman, said to be worth between half a million and a million dollars at the time, she was also one of the greatest philanthropists in the nation's history. She focused on uplifting the black community, helping black people overcome Jim Crow and achieve full citizenship and equality. That was her greatest wish. Sarah died on the 25th of May 1919 from kidney failure and complications of hypertension aged only 51. She knew she was dying before it happened, she got incredibly ill and knew it was time to put her affairs in order and revised her will. She left two thirds of the future net profit of her company to charity, as well as leaving thousands of dollars to various individuals and schools. She even left an amount to the orphan's home which looked after Alelia in her childhood. She never forgot anyone who helped her on her journey. Upon her mother's death, Alelia became president of the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company. 
But Alilia would also die at a young age, aged just 46 in 1931, also from hypertension. And after her death, the company was taken over by her daughter, May Walker, who was then succeeded by her daughter, Alilia May Perry Bundles, the mother of Alilia Bundles, the Madam C.J. Walker biographer. The company ceased operations in 1981. However, in 2013, Madam Walker's brand was purchased by the New Voices Foundation, which helps female entrepreneurs of colour. New Voices was founded by a man called Richo Dennis, the owner of Essence magazine and founder of Sundial Brands, which is now a division of Unilever. New Voices also purchased Villa Luaro and they plan on renovating the estate to be used as a training centre or retreat for black female entrepreneurs. Sundial relaunched the brand as Madam CJ Walker Beauty Culture, which went on to be sold in Sephora with products like shampoos, conditioners and hair masks. I think you can still get your hands on the products today in the USA, but I'll leave the website link down below in case anyone is interested in checking out her legacy. And there you go, there's the story of Sarah Breedlove, Madam CJ Walker an incredible woman who had the hardest possible start in life and went on to make a change, not only for herself, but for so many others. Many people now simply know her for being the first female self-made millionaire in the USA, but perhaps she should be known for her philanthropy instead. She used her riches and status for so many good things. A badass woman and a role model for all. I first heard about her story in a podcast not too long ago and knew that I just had to share this with you all. She is just such an incredible woman. She did so many good things. She helped so many people. And me being here in the UK, I can't say she was ever somebody that I had heard about or learned about before. And it's always great to hear about another incredible woman. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Let me know if there's anybody else you want me to talk about and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.